I was just going to invite the rest of you to come forward and sit down, but there are frankly not many not that many places to sit, so I'm, I'm sorry you'll have to probably stand. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to welcome you to these beautiful premises of Severo Institute, the School for Legal and Social Studies. Uh, my name is Dan Chesney, and the best way to start is to explain why I am here. Um, I don't want to be self-centered, but I'm such an unknown person that I should explain that. Normally, you would expect my colleague Yusufshima to be here, the rector, the, the president of the university, but he turned out to be more indispensable elsewhere. He needs to be uh, with, his, uh, with, it, with um, his kids in a, in a hospital, uh, which is why he asked me to, um, to uh, take his position and walk you through the program of this afternoon. Um, this event is part of the Tsevro Institute Academic Forum series. These, these events are generally a platform for inviting important speakers in various fields um, that discuss the social issues that are um, part, of the, um, part of the program of the university. In the past, we had important people speak in here, and, I, and, I, and you had a chance to uh, have a glimpse on them. Just to remind you, we had uh, Richard Epstein of University of Chicago. Uh, we had David Friedman of Santa Clara University. David Schmitz of University of Arizona, or Pete Betke of George Mason University, to name uh, just a few. Um, the common denominator of all these people, of all these speakers, is that they do not represent some, any, any high-flown theory or abstract theory, but are really um, are, um, scholars that like to discuss real-world problems. All their theories revolve around problems that are readily applicable, uh, whether they be from perspective of legal theory, um, of um, economics, political economy, or philosophy. Which is why it's, I mean, it's no coincidence that these four take place or are organized by the Tsevro Institute. Uh, Several Institute runs programs uh, in bachelor's and, and master's degree. They, they award bachelor's and master's degree in precisely those fields in private law, public law, political science, economics, and economic policy. Now, the topic today is, um, has a distinctly uh, green flavor. Uh, although we had in the past people of that sort, we had, uh, if some of you remember, Terry Anderson, of, of Hoover's institution. Um, this is the first time that we will discuss one particular environmental problem. Uh, the literally hot topic, or as, as Bjorn would probably prefer, a somewhat lukewarm topic, um, the topic of global warming. Uh, so let me briefly introduce Bjorn, Bjorn, Bjorn Lomborg. Bjorn is an academic who turned really into what I think is a popular writer, a popularizer of science, who is so successful in his field that he was repeatedly rated or, or voted uh, among the most influential thinkers in the world. To name the few, he was voted uh, among the top 100 of most influential people by, Time, by the Time magazine, the top 75 by the Esquire magazine, now consider this, top 50 by the UK Guardian. And I was only waiting to find out that the next one was top 25, but unfortunately he fell down to top 100 again this year um, when, he was, uh, when he was voted top one, among the top 100 uh, by the uh, Foreign Policy magazine, if I'm not mistaken. Now Bjorn happens to reside in Prague from July, uh, so he is uh, almost a Czech. By that, by that nature, so I'm sure we can uh, share some of the credit for all that um, with him. Now, his area of interest is, um, believe it or not, to, is very simple, to help the world, to help the world uh, to be a better place. And he tries to do that with a very simple idea, which is enshrined, I think, in his, in his motto, uh, get the facts straight. 
and that is by simply prioritizing um, among the world's most pressing problems. So he's not really um, pointing to what the problems are, but he's selecting what problems are most worth um, of solution. This is the main idea behind the famous Copenhagen consensus. Now, the, as the global warming has surely the potential uh, to be a, a global and dangerous problem, it is no wonder that Bjorn um, very often found himself and finds himself commenting precisely on this problem. Um, his book, Cool It, which is offered in Czech translation out there, by the way, um, made him a definitive authority on that issue. Not because he would be considered a specialist in, the, in, in natural sciences or anything like that, but he, he became an expert simply by framing the discussion with the appropriate dat data that's not uh, actually challenged by either part of the debate. So he's using data that's accepted by all of them and showing uh, what the priorities are and uh, what are the um, good ways to deal with that problem. Um, his presentation will last about uh, 40 minutes and then we'll have about half an hour for questions. Um, now with no further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Bjorn here in Prague. Thank you very much. Um, and it's a great pleasure to be here. It's my first talk in Prague. Um, while I'm a resident here, I enjoy very much being here. And I'm sorry I don't speak Czech apart from Jakui, which I'm not even sure I get right. So, uh, so fundamentally, what I'd like to talk about is really how we should think about dealing with global warming smartly. But of course, also, as, as Dan pointed out, in some sense, this is just another way of looking at how we should deal with a lot of different problems in the world. Remember, global warming is not the only problem. It's certainly one of the big problems that we talk about, but there are many other problems that we perhaps should also be considering. I'll get back to that at the very end. But fundamentally, I'd like to talk about how should we tackle global warming. So what I bring to the table, and really what the people that I work with bring to the table, is not specific uh, natural science knowledge, but it's economics. It's about talking about what works rather than just what feels good. And remember, when we talk about global warming or any other issue, we very often just talk about really trying to make for a better world. One of my concerns is that we should do that rationally, but we very often end up doing it in a fashionable way. We end up doing what feels good rather than what does good. I'd like us to get back to doing what does good. But a lot of us just puts up solar panels on our rooftops and feel like, oh, I've saved the world, or change our light bulbs into those energy-saving light bulbs. There's nothing wrong with these solutions, but they're not the ones that are actually going to solve global warming. And I'd like us to get back to talking about what will actually work. The second part is remove our myths. We have a lot of understandings of what works and especially what doesn't work in global warming. I think it'd be useful to perhaps go through a few of those and get a sense of maybe we could do better than what we've done in the past. But we need to confront our myths. Now, remember, again, there's nothing special about myths in, in, in global warming. There are myths in a lot of different areas. But perhaps in global warming, they're more entrenched because it's also a very particularly politically hyped area. So again, it's useful to get clearer knowledge. And then, of course, at the end, this is what all econo economics is about. We need to spend our money in the best possible way. If we spend money on poor topics, on poor solutions, that money can't be spent well elsewhere. So let's try to get these three things. That's really what I want to talk about. And of course, again, global warming is such a huge issue area. There are lots and lots of conversations in there. And you know, the UN Climate Panel publishes perhaps three 800-page reports every four or five years. That's just summaries of the tens of thousands of peer-reviewed published articles on the topic. There's no way we can have a sensible democratic conversation on saying, could you please have read all of that before we start? You know, we can't have that. So what I'd like to really do is just to make four simple points 
on how I think we should frame global warming if we're going to have a smarter conversation on that. So really, this conversation is about what should we do on global warming. I, I've been told that you can't really have a conversation about global warming without a picture of Al Gore. So, uh, so here it is. Gore and I gave a presentation to Congress a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is like the second before he realizes who I am. Uh, but but you know, fundamentally, of course, the point here is that Gore and many, many others uh, Connie Hedegaard, the, uh, the Danish Commissioner for Climate in the EU, and many others have good intentions on global warming. My dispute with them is not that they're not good people. I believe they're good people. I believe they want to do good. There's a lot of people out there, especially in the global warming community, that want to do good. My dispute is not with that. But I am going to argue that sometimes their political solutions just don't work. And that's why we need to start talking about, could we do this better? So the first point I want to make is global warming is real, it's man-made, it is an important problem. So let's get that out of the way. I think there's an unhealthy, if you will, uh, conversation, especially in the global warming community, that's either it's not happening at all or it's the end of the world. I don't think either of those positions are very well founded. And I think there's good reason to believe that the truth is somewhere in the middle that global warming is indeed real, but it's not the end of the world. Let me just show you here. Yes, global warming is real. It's on the agenda. I actually think we should thank Al Gore for having put it on the agenda. But we should also have a sense of how much of a problem is it. Well, the UN Climate Panel, the IPCC, tells us that they expect that temperature rises over the next 100 years will be on the order of, especially if I can push the right button, 2.6 to 2 .6 degrees somewhere between 1.6 and 3.8 degrees centigrade, higher by the end of the century. That doesn't sound like too much, but remember, this is an average across the entire globe, so this is not a trivial issue. How much of a problem would this give us? Well, I'll, I'll get back to some of the specifics, but let's just get a general sense of how much this will actually cost. If you look at economic models, and I think this is one of the beauties of economic models, they can give us a sense of what's the total impact of a temperature rise if you sum up all the bad things that are going to happen and also all the good things. There are some good things. We'll get back to them. But they're mostly bad things that are going to happen with global warming. The models come out and tell us the total cost of global warming throughout the 21st and 22nd century is in the order of $20 trillion. That's a huge number. It used to be bigger before the financial crisis, but it's still a big number, right? So it's something that ought to make us sit up straight and think, all right, how are we going to fix this problem that's going to cost us $20 trillion? But we also need to have a sense of proportion because we very often sense, oh, whoa, that's a big problem. We should throw everything at it. Well, how big of a problem? Well, if you take the total net worth of the 21st century, that's about $3,000 trillion. So we're talking about 0.7% of the 21st century. And I think that's a pretty good understanding of what is the problem with global warming. Global warming's problem is not zero, but it's not 100% either, as some people like to believe. So it's not nothing, but it's not 100%. It's 0.7%. It's a 0.7% of the 21st century problem. And, of course, remember, there's nothing true about these numbers. These are order of magnitude numbers. It could easily be 0 0.3 or 1 1.5. You know, but it's in that order of magnitude. And that gives us a pretty good handle on this. It's a problem we need to fix. It's not nothing. It's not the end of the world. It's a problem we need to fix. And that's where I think we need to have the conversation because a lot of the conversation right now is on panic it's the sense that, oh my God, the world is coming to an end. We need to do something. And when people are in that sense, in that frame of mind, they very rarely make good decisions. That's why I'd like us to start talking about how can we actually fix the problem. So how do we get a smart strategy? So yes, global warming is real. It's man-made. It is an important problem. But very often, the way that you are presented in the media, everywhere else, with facts on global warming, they're very often exaggerated and or one-sided, which lead to poor policy judgment. So I'd like to take you through a few of those 
claims that we have on global warming. But I'm sure we'll have more of this in, in the questions afterwards. So I simply just wanted to give you a, a peek on some of the things that lead to bad judgment when we're talking about global warming. You know, Al Gore, again, I'm, I'm just picking Al Gore, but everybody really have said it. he's just the best sort of uh, aggregator in, in, in that sense. Al Gore tells us that global warming is a planetary emergency. Uh, this is from, uh, from the website for his film, but, and, and which certainly for a couple of years, where the very definition of how you worried about global warming, he told us, we have just 10 years to avert a major catastrophe that could send our entire planet into a tailspin of epic destruction involving extreme weather, floods, droughts, epidemics, and killer heat waves beyond anything you've ever experienced. This certainly sounds like something we want to avoid, right? So it might be useful to start talking about how true are these sorts of claims. And again, these are the kinds of claims you hear in public television and in the radio, in the newspapers, all the time. I'll just take you through three of these issues. Well, I actually wrote four, but I'm just going to show you the three of them. Uh, heat deaths, sea level rise, hurricanes, and malaria. These are by no means the only ones. But I'd like to show you how some of these ones, which are some of the ones that we know best from the science, are just not reflected in the way that we often describe them in the popular literature. Take a look, for instance, on heat waves. Are we going to see more heat waves because of global warming? Yeah. It's really very simple. If temperatures rise, you're going to see more heat waves and hence more people die from heat. It's very simple. So they're absolutely right when they tell us that because of global warming, we're going to see more heat waves, we're going to see more people dying from heat. So how many? Well, we actually have great studies, especially for Europe. We have a, a cross-national study from, uh, from 2000 uh, in Europe. About 50 researchers have looked at all uh, 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 nations in Europe, how many people are going to die from heat and from cold. And what they estimated was, for instance, if you look at the UK by mid-century, because of global warming, we're estimating that about 2,000 more people are going to die because of global warming. That's a big number. We should definitely own up to that and say, wow, 2,000 more people are going to die every year by mid-century because of global warming. We should do something about that. But the problem here I have with this sort of argument is it's very one-sided. Sure, if temperatures rise, we're going to see more heat waves and hence more people die from heat. But surely, if temperatures rise, we're also going to see fewer cold waves and hence fewer people dying from cold maybe that would also be worth pointing out. Now, of course, if this was a trivial number of people, maybe it wouldn't matter, but it's not. The very same studies that show the 2,000 more people dying from heat waves, which are the ones that everyone uses, also show that by mid-century, because of less cold in the UK, we're going to see about 20,000 fewer cold deaths. Now, telling us there's going to be 2,000 more people dying from heat, which is true because of global warming, but failing to tell us that there's going to be 20,000 fewer dying from cold is not a good way to inform the conversation. And again, it's not just the UK. I mean, we probably also know here in Prague, I certainly know from back in Denmark, that maybe global warming is not such a bad thing as if it's really cold. But you could imagine maybe this is not true for the rest of the world. Well, actually, it turns out to be true for virtually all regions in the world. Many more people die from cold in virtually all areas except sub-Saharan Africa. So we're estimating about 100, sorry, 400,000 extra heat deaths by mid-century because of global warming, but 1.8 million fewer cold deaths. We need to own up to those th numbers. It's not just such that global warming is worse for everything. It's worse for some things and better for other things, and we need to encapsulate all of those. Now, I'm not saying, hey, maybe we should have more global warming. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. I'm simply saying we need to be honest and tell the whole story. The second part of this, of course, is also just to ask ourselves, if we want to help future victims of heat waves, why is it we insist on there's only one solution, namely cut carbon emissions? Is that really the best way to help future victims of heat waves? I mean, look, for instance, in the U.S. There's virtually no heat deaths in the U.S. Why? Why is there no heat deaths in the U.S.? 
air conditioning. If you worry about people dying from heat waves, maybe you should give them air conditioning. Of course, this feels very, very politically incorrect because somehow you're Im increasing emissions. But I'm just really surprised when people worry about it. You remember the big heat wave in Europe uh, in 2003 in August that kills about 45,000 people across Europe, perhaps 7,000, 7,500 just in Paris? And mostly old, elderly women that were left alone in their apartments, and, and people saying, we need to cut carbon emissions to make sure that future generations of old women in Paris, France, don't die from heat waves. Well, if you don't want them to die, maybe we should give them heat, uh, sorry, uh, air conditioning, right? If we want to help people, there are very, very simple ways to do so very effectively. But of course, again, that would increase emissions, and that makes some people feel uncomfortable. But there are other ways that you could think about ways to help people from heat waves that are even CO2 neutral. Most cities around the world are much hotter than their surrounding countrysides because there's lots of asphalt and very few trees. So fundamentally, they're heat sinks. Uh, Tokyo is probably the biggest heat sink in the world. Tokyo in August is about 12 and a half degrees centigrade warmer than its surrounding countryside. And this is, mind you, a, an area of about 40,000 square kilometers. Right? It's a huge area that's incredibly hot. Kills a lot of people. But if that's the problem, and of course, remember, up to 80 or 90 percent of all people are going to be living in cities by the end of the century. So if we look at where most people are going to live, if that's the problem, maybe we should do something about those issues. And those are very, very simple. You know, if we take London, and if we did something about the fact that there are very few trees, which means that there's less evaporation and hence more heat. If we added more water and greenery, we're estimating that we could reduce heat wave temperatures about 8 degrees centigrade. Much, much more than you could ever do through climate change policies. Much faster, much cheaper, and much more beautiful. So again, the idea here is to say, why is it we've become so obsessed with saying the only legitimate solution to handling problems of, of heat wave deaths is by cutting carbon emissions when there are much, much smarter, simpler, cheaper, more effective ways to deal with that. That's again the problem. And, and of course, if the problem is there's lots of asphalt in most cities, lots of black surfaces, why don't we do something about that? If we made more light surfaces, if we paint it a quarter of the tarmac in London. And again, these are not frivolous studies. These are studies that have been done for London, for New York, for Tokyo, for many other places. If we did that, or if we painted a quarter of all uh, black rooftops in London, we would reduce heat wave temperatures about 10 degrees, much, much more than you could ever do with global warming, much lower cost, much faster. So my point here really is twofold. It's both to say, we are being told only part of the story when we are being told there are more heat deaths. That's true, but we have failed to be true. There are even more avoided cold deaths. But also we are being told the only way to save those people, the only way to help the future is to cut carbon emissions. But if you actually want to help those people, if you actually want to help people dying from heat waves, there are much, much cheaper, much more effective, much simpler ways to help many more people faster. By air conditioning, by making cities cooler. That point is true for virtually all of the things that we talk about. If you look at sea level rise, for instance, yes, sea levels will rise, but it's not going to be a catastrophe. The UN central estimate is about 30 centimeters over the next century, not the six meters that you very often hear. If you saw Al Gore's film, did, did you see Al Gore's film? It's a, you know, it's a very stunning piece of work. You see how six meters of sea level rise is going to eradicate all of San Francisco and New York and Holland, of course, and, and Beijing and Shanghai and Bombay. It's a very long film. But, but the problem, of course, is it's not true. We're not talking about six meters of sea level rise. We're talking about 30 centimeters. And how much of a problem is 30 centimeters? What we know, because over the last 150 years, Sea levels rose 30 centimeters. Did anyone notice? Imagine asking a very old person who lived through most of the 20th century and ask her, what were the important problems of the 20th century? She'll talk about the world wars, the suffrage for women, maybe the IT revolution, but she's not going to say, oh, and sea levels rose. Right? That's important because it indicates sea levels rising is a cost 
but it's a cost that our much poorer and much less technically proficient forefathers were pretty good at handling. And of course, we will handle that too, at a cost. But it's certainly not going to be a catastrophe. And likewise also, let's just try and get a sense of how much of a problem is it. A lot of people like to point out the Maldives or other places where sea level rise indeed will be a big problem. Remember, these are mainly because they're very small places. They're very beautiful. Uh, the Maldives, if you see a 30 min, uh, centimeter sea level rise, how much would that do? Well, the models, if you just look at the ISO curves of the, uh, of the Maldives, would eradicate 77% of the country. It would cost them 121% of their GDP. Of course, that would be a catastrophe for the Maldives. But that also assumes that they don't do anything. That's a little bit like assuming me standing on the beach at the Maldives in 2020 and the sea is lapping up over my knees and I just stand there for another 80 years until I drown? Well, most people don't actually do that. They take action. That's, of course, why we have done this, why we have been able to handle 30 centimeters of sea level rise. And, of course, the Maldives will do so too because it's very, very cheap to build, essentially, dikes, storm walls, to make infrastructure that makes you much more uh, 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 um, resilient. We're estimating that about 0.04% of GDP, of the Maldives' GDP, they can safeguard virtually all of their dry land. The simple economic question is, are the Maldives going to spend... Am I going to be able to point with this? I'm not sure. Well, let me just do this. Are the Maldives going to spend 0.04% of their GDP to avoid a loss of 121% of their GDP? Uh, yeah. And that's, of course, what we've done. That's what everyone will do. And that's why we tend to fail to understand that adaptation will handle a very large part of this. Now, this is not the same thing as saying it's, it'll handle all problems. There will still be some dry land lost for the Maldives. But then again, the question is, how do we help the Maldives best? Do we help the Maldives best by cutting our carbon emissions and cutting growth in the world? Or do we help them best by making sure that they get rich fast? Well, the UN has actually... Oh. Well, it turns out that if you ask the main UN climate models, in the model where we cut dramatically and where we reduce sea level rise from about 30 centimeters down to about 22 centimeters, we cut about a third of the sea level rise. We also cut about a third of world GDP. Now, it does mean that the Maldives have less damage to contend with, but it also means they have less money to handle it with. And if you run the models in those two scenarios, it actually turns out that the Maldives will overall lose more dry land if we cut our carbon emissions because they will be less able to pay for the things that will make sure that they don't lose dry land. So what we tend to forget is we think the only thing that's important is sea level rise. But in reality, of course, what matters to a very large extent is how rich are we? If we're rich, we can handle a lot of problems. If we're not so rich, we can't handle as many problems. And so let's make sure we don't actually end up cutting carbon emissions and making the world poor in order to try to help the Maldives, when in fact, when we look at sea level rise, we could actually end up making them less well off. Let me also just show you hurricanes. Hurricanes obviously took on an added significance because of Hurricane Sandy now. Um, but if you look, this is the damage cost. I wanted to update it till 2012 before I came here, but I have the numbers, but I just couldn't get them in the, in a, in the Excel sheet before I, I had to go here. But they, they look pretty much the same. Hurricane Sandy would be about here. Uh, so fundamentally, what we see here is the damage cost across the last century, and, and this one from 1900 till 2009 in this graph. Uh, and it seems very clear what we're seeing here is essentially a dramatic increase, uh, of course, exacerbated by Hurricane Katrina and some of the others that happened in 2004 and especially in 2005. So this seems totally to indicate, yes, global warming is making this worse and worse. We're going to see more and more damage. This is just for the U.S., uh, where we have the best uh, hurricane data, but this really is probably true for all uh, of the world. This seems to indicate that things are just going to get worse and worse, and that's absolutely true. But it has virtually nothing to do with global warming. Why? 
Because this is mainly a fact of the fact, uh, this is mainly a consequence of the fact that many more people live where hurricanes hit, and they have much more stuff. Remember, the average of in in 1930, all of the Atlantic and Caribbean coastlines in the U.S., all those counties in the U.S., had as many people present as just Dade and Broward in southern Florida and Miami. Has today, so we have many, many more people living close to where hurricanes hit. Why? Because it's really beautiful to live where hurricanes hit when they don't hit. Right? That's why most people want to live there. So we actually have, while the U.S. population quadrupled over the last century, the coastal population of the U.S. increased 50-fold. So not very surprising. You know, take a look. This is Miami in 1926. Is it pretty clear that if a hurricane hits here, we have to move the deck chairs? But it's not clear that very much damage is going to happen. Whereas, of course, this is the same place in 2006. Is it clear if hurricanes hit here? Yes, we're going to have slightly bigger damage. And so, what researchers did was they said, "All right, well, let's take a take a look at this, and then look at what would have happened." If all hurricanes that hit the U.S. since 1900 hit the U.S. as it looks today, so essentially trying to uh, 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 correct both for population and for wealth, because you have a lot more wealth, and so when hurricanes hit, you're going to lose a lot more. Let's just take a look at what that will、uh, what that would look like. Very very different outcome. Essentially, the biggest hurricane in the U.S. history would have been the Great Miami Hurricane that tore right through downtown Miami in 1926. But of course, back then there was virtually nothing to damage. But if it had hit today, it would have been the most costly hurricane in U.S. history. The second largest would have been、uh, the Great Galveston Hurricane in 1900, which also killed more people, about five times as many as Hurricane Katrina. And Katrina would only have been the third largest.、Uh, it adds up to more because there are more hurricanes in, in the hurricane season 2005. Fundamentally, what this indicates is that there's probably no signal here from global warming. If actually what we believe is Right now, with the models, that we'll probably see slightly fewer hurricanes, but slightly stronger hurricanes, which may actually increase damages slightly. But of course, the vast increase that we're seeing is because of more people. Just like when we look at Hurricane Sandy, we tend to think of Hurricane Sandy as something terrible, but of course, in reality, New York was inundated in 1938 by a much bigger hurricane. Hurricane Sandy wasn't even a hurricane when it hit New York. That's why they call it a superstorm because they couldn't call it a hurricane. So again, let's remember what actually matters here: is we're being told one set of stories. We're being told, "Oh my God, it's getting worse and worse." But what we fail to remember is that this has very little to do with hurricane. Sorry, with global warming. It has everything to do with adaptation. And so again, isn't it curious? If we look at reasonable worst-case scenarios and estimate that we're actually going to see slightly stronger hurricanes by mid-century, if we do a reasonable worst-case scenario, damage caused by global warming is probably going to be about 10 percent higher by mid-century. But damage caused because more people live with more stuff closer to harm's way by 2050 will probably increase about 500 percent. My concern is that we all talk phenomenally much about doing something about this, and totally fail to remember what can we do about this. If we want to help future generations not having as much damage, and this both true in the U.S. but certainly also in the Philippines that were just hit by two typhoons, if we want to help people, maybe we should start looking at reducing this, the social vulnerability. We don't talk about this at all. How could we do that? Well, two simple things is, for instance, to make sure that we have better flood protection, that we have better building codes, that we have better enforcement of building codes. One other way would be to make sure that we don't subsidize insurance, which they do pretty much everywhere in the rich world where you have hurricane risks. Why? Because it's politically very convenient, but of course it encourages people to build irresponsibly. If I know I can get cheap insurance, I'll just keep building where it's really beautiful, and every time my house gets trashed. Somebody comes and rebuild it, right? So people build irresponsibly. If we cut, if we both cut our subsidies to insurance and 
we at the same time made sure that people actually had better building codes, we estimate that we could probably cut this 250 to 400 percentage points. We might even make this negative. We might actually reduce damages in the long run if we were smart. Instead, all we do is we talk about this. If we had managed to do all of the Kyoto Protocol, which of course we didn't, we could have cut this half a percentage point. I can't even show you how little that is. Why is it we're so obsessed with one solution when it's the other one that's staring us right in the face? That's really the problem about much of the global warming conversation, that there's only one solution, cut carbon emissions, when indeed most other solutions would be much smarter, much cheaper, much more effective, much more helpful for future generations. Let me just show you the last one. This is for the developing world. The idea that we're going to see more malaria because of global warming. Yeah, that's probably true. Uh, malaria is weakly correlated to heat. But of course, remember, it's strongly correlated to wealth. Fundamentally, if you're poor, you get malaria and you die from malaria. If you're rich, you don't get malaria. And even if you get malaria, you don't die from malaria. So again, my concern is, why is it everybody seems to say, oh, there's going to be more malaria, so we should regulate the temperature instead of perhaps controlling the treatment, making sure that people don't get sick. Yes, global warming will probably raise the number of people that will get malaria by about 3%. But of course, remember, there's 100% right now. So what we're talking about is we're going to go from 100% to 103%, and the global warming people worry about the 3%, I think we should worry about the 100% first. Or to put it very graphically for you, if you look at how many people could we help with a Kyoto policy, if we actually manage to do all of the Kyoto Protocol, we're estimating that throughout this century we could save about 1,400 people every year from dying from malaria. That's good. I'd like to be part of a civilization that cares so much about people that it saves 1,400 people every year. But let's just remember, if we focused on actually helping people with malaria, we could save about 850,000 people from dying from malaria each year. And, oh, by the way, the Kyoto Protocol cost about $180 billion, whereas the malaria-specific proposals would cost about $3 billion. So to put it very, very clearly, for every dollar that climate change policies could save a person from malaria, the same amount of money spent on malaria could save 36,000 people from dying from malaria. My point is simply, wouldn't you rather want to save 36,000 people first before you save just one? And that's really the main point here, that we've been told global warming is real, and it is. It is a problem. It's not the end of the world, but it is a problem. But then we're being told a lot of exaggerated, one-sided stories to make us say, we should solve global warming because we want to help people by not getting inundated. We want them to not getting heat waves or not getting uh, tropical hurricanes or not getting malaria. All of those solutions, all of those problems, there are much better solutions for much simpler, much cheaper, much more effective ones. This doesn't mean we shouldn't tackle global warming, but it means we can stop being panicky about it and start talking about, well, so how do we fix global warming? My problem is that all the solutions that have been up there, the Copenhagen, the Durban, the one that just ended in, Dur uh, uh, in Doha, don't work. The Kyoto Protocol doesn't work for very simple reasons. We're essentially asking people to cut carbon emissions when it's costly for them and does virtually no good 100 years for you for, from now. Just take a look, for instance, the Kyoto Protocol. It would have cost about $180 billion a year. This is the average of all the macroeconomic models that have looked at the Kyoto Protocol. It would have reduced temperatures by an immeasurable 0 0.004 degrees centigrade, one half of one hundredth of one degree centigrade by the end of the century. That's ridiculous. Of course, we didn't actually carry through the Kyoto Protocols, and now the model estimates are even smaller. We're talking about stuff that we can't even measure in 100 years. So we're talking about spending lots and lots of real money right now in order to help future generations nothing. That's not a smart way to help the world. 
But of course, the argument then is, well, if we can't do the Kyoto Protocol, we've got to do even more. That's what the EU is say saying now. The EU has made its 2020-2020 decision. It's a long story. I'm not going to bore you with that. But let's just call it the 2020 decision to cut carbon emissions 20% below 1990 levels by 2020. If you run it through the models, again, the average of all the macroeconomic models tell us the cost is going to be about $250 billion a year. Yet the benefit will be to reduce temperatures by 1 20th of 1 degree centigrade by the end of the century. If the EU does this every year for the rest of the century, remember this is not going to be cheap. This is about $20 trillion. Oh, by the way, the same amount, the total global warming costs, right? So the EU is going to spend $20 trillion of your money to do no good in 100 years. Not surprisingly, the economic estimates indicate that for every dollar we spend, we will probably do about three cents of good. We'll avoid three cents of climate damage. Now, that's a little good, but it's phenomenally wasteful. We're wasting 97 cents of every dollar we're spending. We're not helping the world very much. And of course, if you look further, pretty much all leaders in the world have signed up one way or another to the so-called two degree target that we don't want temperatures to rise beyond two degrees above pre-industrial levels. If you run the models, half of the models tell us we can't do this, so we've essentially promised something we can't do. But the other half of the models tell us, yeah, there's still a window to do it. So we're looking at the optimistic set of the models. The average of those models tell us that the total cost of this towards the end of the century will be $40,000 billion a year, 13% of global GDP. And remember, this is if everyone does all the right things at all the right times. For every dollar spent, we will avoid two cents of climate damage with these proposals. And they are incredibly optimistic proposals because, of course, politicians are not actually going to do all the right things, coordinate it all the way through the century, across all continents, across all political domains. Not going to happen. So my point here is to say, why is it we have such a long list of stuff that doesn't work? Because global warming is not really about solving the problem. It's about feeling good. It's about putting up some windmills and some solar panels and feel like we've, we've saved the world. Well, we haven't. I would like us to start talking about if you want to solve specific problems like malaria, solve malaria. If you want to solve global warming, let's start talking about what actually works. The fundamental problem of global warming is it costs money to cut carbon emissions. A lot of people will tell you, oh, we can get rich going on to a green economy. That was essentially what the UN tried to tell us in June in, in, in the Rio Plus 20 uh, uh, Earth Summit. But if you look at the economic growth out this way over the last quarter century and CO2 growth, you see a very strong correlation. Not surprisingly, because economic growth is based on the availability of energy. Remember, we don't actually burn fossil fuels. We don't emit CO2 to annoy Al Gore. We do it because it powers everything we like about civilization. It makes it possible to be light in here, to be warm in here, to transport us here. It allows us pretty much everything we want. And of course, everything that about 3 billion people on this planet still need to get. So we're not going to get off a path where we keep increasing our CO2 emissions as long as fossil fuels are the cheapest source of energy. So that's why I would like us to start talking about, well, what are some of the smart solutions instead? And if you'll just allow me before I do that to give you a metaphor, because I, I think it's such a beautiful metaphor. If you look at polar bears, polar bears have become the icon of global warming. You know, if you see a picture of an, a polar bear, you think global warming, right? And they're really cute and fussy. Of course, only in pictures. You don't actually want to be close to one. Uh, but the idea here is to say, yes, polar bears will have problems because of diminishing and eventually disappearing some Arctic ice. So there is a problem. That's true. But I bet you there are two things you don't know about the polar bears. One, 
is that polar bears are not in any way immediately endangered. Actually, polar, global polar bear populations dramatically increased over the last 50 years. It's gone up from about 5,000 individuals to about now 22,000. These are totally uncontroversial numbers. But the second thing is, what should you do to help them? The answer always seems to be cut carbon emissions, right? That's, that's the way we, we talk about this. But isn't it curious, nobody ever tell you how many polar bears are you, are you going to save if you, if you cut carbon emissions? I think it's because they don't like the outcome of the solution. If we actually did this, if we implemented the Kyoto Protocol, remember, this would be 20 times as much as what the world has actually managed to do. If we did the full Kyoto Protocol for the rest of the century, how many polar bears would you save? If you run the models, it turns out the answer is probably about a polar bear a year. Now, I like polar bears. I want to save polar bears. I might even want to pay $180 billion for one. But I'm surprised about the fact that we don't talk about the issue that every year the world shoots polar bears. And not just a few of them. Every year the world shoots somewhere between 300 and 500 polar bears. And so my, my, my question here, wouldn't it be smarter to perhaps not shoot 300 polar bears first? Apart from the fact that it would be $180 billion cheaper, it would also be better for 299 polar bears. And so the simple point that I'm trying to, to get to here is simply, if we care about the problems that we talk about when we talk about global warming, they're often much, much smarter ways. Let's stop shooting polar bears. Of course, this is not a long, long-term solution. There will still need to be a global warming solution by mid-century. But this is certainly a solution that will work for another couple of decades. And that gives us time to start thinking about how do we tackle the issue of global warming. So fundamentally, we need to find smart solutions. That's, so, uh, this is a book I wrote together with some of the world's top climate economists, about 27 of them uh, and three Nobel laureates, on how do we tackle global warming. In many ways, the uh, uh, cool it that you, the, uh, uh, that you could see down there is, is sort of a popular, uh, popularization of this. Fundamentally, the problem is solar panels cost much more than fossil fuels right now. So if you try to get people to do the cuts, you're essentially asking, could you please pay a lot more? That's why you can get Germany to do this as long as it doesn't really matter. Sure, we can subsidize them. But then a lot of people start buying solar panels, and then you can't afford them anymore. That's why the Germans basically cut back. Remember, the Germans, despite being the biggest consumers of solar power in the world per capita, only get 0.3% of their energy from solar. So as long as solar panels cost more, you just can't get to this point. So there are really two ways. Either you force everyone to buy more of these incredibly expensive solar panels, which is the one that we've been trying for the last 20 years and it hasn't worked. Or we try to innovate the price down so that these solar panels become cheaper than fossil, uh, 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 fossil fuels. If they're cheaper than fossil fuels, we don't have a problem anymore. Everyone would switch, also the Chinese and the Indians. So the fundamental point here is to, instead of saying, you shall not, you have to cut down, if we focus on innovation, we could do a lot more. That was what the economists came out and said was the best long-term solution to global warming. They proposed to spend 0.2% of GDP on research and development into non-carbon emitting energy technologies. Now, I'm not just saying it should be solar. I think it should be all kinds of different things. But the beauty is this will be about $100 billion globally a year. That's about half the cost of the Kyoto, and it's about 10 times what we spend right now. So we could do much, much more at much lower cost. That's a winner in this condition. We can actually do it cheaper, and we can do it much more effectively. And of course, the point is, again, you know, let's look at a lot of different things, renewables, fish and fusion, conservation, energy storage. We need to look at all of these technologies. But the beauty is most of them are going to fail. That's fine, because we just need a few of them to come through. And those are the ones that are going to power the rest of the 21st century. But the trick is to say, don't put up a lot of inefficient technology today. Make sure that you make efficient technology for the next two to four decades. 
This will actually, the models indicate, solve global warming in the medium term, not in the short term, but nothing will, but in the medium term. And for every dollar spent, you will avoid about $11 of climate damage. So you'll do about 500 times more good than most of the current political climate proposals. That's the real way to fix global warming. So I've really just made three points. Global warming is real, yes. It's not the end of the world, and it's often dramatically misleadingly represented, which makes us panic and make bad decisions. I've tried to show you what are good suggestions instead. Policy should be focused on making sure that we get investment into research and development so that we generate the technologies that will then essentially take over, instead of having this deadly and uncompromising and unworkful solutions that we have right now. Let's cut carbon emissions and those proposals keep coming back and we never seem to get it right. I did promise you four and then I'll also stop. But there's a fourth uh, point that I think is incredibly important as well. It is that there are many, many other problems in the world. We focus so much on global warming, it soaks up all the oxygen in the room, but it really isn't the only issue. We need to fix global warming, yes, and we're an advanced civilization. We can do several things at once. And we can spend the money to make sure we fix global warming. But only if we spend little money smartly on global warming so that we have money left over to remember that there are many other problems. Now, we talk about them. We talked about malaria before, but only in the terms of global warming. But in reality, of course, there are still millions of people that need our help. There's a billion people starving. There's two billion people without clean drinking water. There's about a billion people who could do with better education. There's two and a half billion people who need access to modern energy. And the list goes on and on and on. So shouldn't we start talking about all the other things we need to do? And that's really the last slide I want to show you. Al Gore and many, many other politicians, Kevin Rudd, for instance, points out that global warming is the chance for us to show how we really care about the world. This is our generational mission. This is our test. Al Gore says, how do you want to be remembered by your kids and grandkids? And I think that's exactly the right question. How do you want to be remembered by your kids and grandkids? How do we want to be remembered by the future? The amazing thing is that many of my good friends, many world leaders, want to be remembered for spending hundreds of billions of dollars every year to do nothing good a hundred years from now. I just don't think our kids are going to go, go, great going there, granddad, when we could have done so much more good. So yes, let's fix global warming smartly, but let's also remember that there are many other things we can do. Let me just give you one example, and this is the kind of stuff that we do in the rest of the Copenhagen Consensus, where we look at what are some of the smartest solutions for the world's big problems. If you look at, for about $100 billion a year, the UN estimate that we could solve all major basic problems in this world. We could give clean drinking water, sanitation, basic health care, education, and food to every single person on the planet. I would like you to just briefly consider how do you want to be remembered spending twice as much money doing virtually no good 100 years from now or half that amount of money and solve all basic problems today. I really don't think we honestly can say, ah, I think I'll go with that gore guy, right? That's why we really need to get this right. We need to fix global warming. I hope I've outlined some of the, the answers to that. But we also need to remember, if we want to be well remembered in 100 years, we should also fix all the other problems of today. Thank you. All right, I, I thank Bjorn for this um, beautifully organized, beautifully simple and convincing uh, lecture or, or talk. Now it is my prerogative to, um, to um, choose uh, people who will get to ask questions. Uh, it's my job is to make the discussion, to make sure the discussion is organized and civilized perhaps, um, which is why I'll ask all of you to uh, introduce yourself before, before you ask the question. Now I'll open the floor for, for questions. Mr. Morgan. 
I am Bedřich Moldan. I am professor in environmental sciences at the Charles University. My background is chemistry and geochemistry. <clears throat> I am very happy to see Bjorn Lomborg as a <clears throat> global warming activist. And uh, I especially like your parallel standing with uh, closed feet, uh, <clears throat> just waiting for Maldives to be drowned. And uh, I very much appreciate your your call for action. Uh, I have a, a few comments uh, and one question. The comments is that uh, I appreciate that you have uh, <coughs> told us that uh, uh, the most reliable uh, source of information is IPCC and uh, I uh, would like to recommend uh, to you, if I may, uh, really to stick to what uh, IPCC is saying and in fact uh, uh, some of the most important uh, dangers which uh, are stressed by IPCC were not mentioned, which are very difficult to fix by any, <clears throat> any amendments of the type you mentioned. For instance, the drought, this is a very essential issue to my understanding. So that's uh, my, my, my first comment. My second comment, which is more serious perhaps, and it is that uh, to my understanding the adaptation measures are not against the mitigation measures. This is not either or. And this is essential to my understanding that uh, you must uh, see both because they are uh, one of uh, them is not the substitute for the other. The mitigation is not substitute for adaptation and adaptation should not be substitute for mitigation. And if you mentioned Kyoto Protocol, this is something which is years, years dead. And we definitely need smarter politics than, uh, than Kyoto Protocol, that's for sure. And we, we definitely don't have only cutting emissions just in a mechanical way, just to cut the, the, the consumption of, of oil or whatever. There are more smarter ways. And my question to you would be, would you, would you recommend, you have recommended a, a, a number of very smart adaptation measures, which is absolutely okay. But uh, would you also be able to recommend some mitigation measures? Because you admitted that in uh, an about uh, half of the century there uh, would be uh, the necessity somehow to tackle the climate change, not by adaptation, but by, by tackling the uh, root causes. And this is definitely the tackling with the, with the carbon, uh, carbon cycle in the in the atmosphere and uh, ocean and uh, uh, the other and the other issues so uh, this is my question thank you well th thank you thank you very much uh, uh, just on the drought uh, uh, as, as you mentioned there are lots of other issues in, in the UN climate panel I would actually argue drought is one of the ones that we understand the least that's one of the reasons why I don't put it in there uh, the models indicate a lot more drought than what we've actually seen which is one of the reasons why I, and I, I think I speak for a lot of the researchers who look at drought. There was just a paper in Nature uh, two weeks ago uh, indicating that drought has not been nearly as bad and likely to get nearly as bad for the next 60 years. Now, who knows? But the, but the point is, it, it seems like that's one of the very weak areas of, of, uh, of, of our, our fore forecasting uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, that's, that's why I don't talk about it. But sure, you know, that also indicates that we need, for instance, to have better water storage one of the things that we don't talk about at all. Um, adaptation mitigation, I don't think anyone disagrees that you need a combination of the two. But the point here is that we have been way focused on mitigation, that is cutting carbon emissions. So if you will, uh, there's been sort of a 90% on mitigation and 10% adaptation, and I think it's much more likely to be correct that it should be perhaps 60% adaptation and 40% cutting carbon emissions. Now, of course, we can have a good discussion about just exactly what are those numbers, but I think it's very clear we have had a vast over-focus on just cutting carbon emissions. That's virtually been all we've been talking about. Remember in the whole Kyoto Protocol and very little in the UN FCCC uh, 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 conversations have been about adaptation. So your question, 
How do you then cut carbon emissions by mid-century? I think the, you, we agree on the goal that you do need to cut carbon emissions, and you actually need to cut it fairly significantly. But I also think we have no sense of how hard that's going to be. Most people in the conversation think it's about you know, putting in energy-saving light bulbs, it's about driving slightly less or maybe getting a slightly more efficient car and stuff like that. But it fails to realize two things. Our emissions are not going down. If anything, our emissions are simply moving to China. So we have moved a lot of our production to China so that we in the West can feel all good and comfortable about ourselves. But of course, we still emit as much or maybe even more, but only different places. And the second thing is that China and India and everybody else are wanting to get their first car and are wanting to get their first refrigerator and their TV and everything else. And sure, they're going to be more energy efficient, but because there are so many of them, we're still going to get dramatically rising CO2 emissions. So the idea that you're just going to have some sort of argument, we'll, we'll agree to cut carbon emissions. It's not happening now. It hasn't happened for the last 20 years, and it's not likely to happen in the future unless we get technology to be cheaper than fossil fuels. If solar panels are cheaper, and I'm, I'm using solar panels as a metaphor for all the different technologies. If solar panels are cheaper, everyone will switch. If they're not cheaper, we won't really get anyone to switch. Of course, if they're 5% more expensive, but that's not where we are at all. We're talking about many multiples more expensive, especially if you calculate the, uh, the, uh, the energy storage. So fundamentally, this is not about showing our goodwill. It's about technology. And that's the way that it's going to be fixed. So my, my real message here today is simply, we've been trying the wrong way to cut carbon emissions because we think it's about willpower. Um, I don't know if you, uh, in, in the UK, sorry, uh, in, in BBC, uh, uh, had a reporter being ethical man for a year where he was going to cut his carbon emissions. And it was a beautiful series of programs. Every week, he'd show how, how hard this was for him. He sold his car. He insulated his house. They, uh, you know, they started buying organic foods, and, and they looked into ecological burials and all this stuff. Uh, by the end of this, he'd really done a lot of stuff. He'd done a lot more than what most people would ever do. They calculated how much he'd cut. He'd cut 20% of his carbon emissions for a year. And then they asked him, and he was being very honest, you know, they asked him, so now you're done being ethical man, what are you going to do? And he said, well, I just bought plane tickets for the whole family to go to Jamaica. <laughs> Which is essentially what we do when we go dieting, right? You save and you don't eat very much, and then you feel like, oh, now I can, you know, now I can eat the Mars bar. But of course, then you just splurge. And that's exactly what we're going to do. If this becomes about the moral issue of you've got to cut carbon emission, we're never going to succeed. If this becomes about the technology, we can succeed. And that's why I, I really try to make this about a different kind of conversation, because I think that's the only way that we can succeed. I'll try to manage everything. Uh, let's start here. Uh, Diego Hustet, uh, uh, Vice President of the Nordic Chamber of Commerce in the Czech Republic. Um, coming from Denmark as well, uh, a lot of the uh, focus in Denmark has been on windmills, which is now a big industry there. There's been a lot of investment in this too. And uh, uh, Connie Hildegard, uh, a couple of years ago here in Prague on the conference as well, was stating that uh, uh, in, in fact what it really meant for Danish economy, the focus on energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy was uh, really that it boosted the industry as well. And it basically gave a lot of working places, it gave a lot of industry, uh, money to the industry and, and, and to the community in that sense. Because of that, well, it pays a lot of taxes and it means, again, a lot of positive for, the, uh, for, for the, uh, the country as such. In the um, Czech Republic and, well, in Spain, solar energy, of course, well, there are these cases where uh, uh, in the night, they were basically lighting on the solar panels in order to generate uh, electricity during the night with subsidized electricity so that they could uh, make even more money on it. Uh, in the Czech Republic, uh, a lot of this ended basically with, I think, a few, quite a few scandals around as well, uh, where just an, a group of companies basically got more rich because of having a chance to invest in this and then the state had to pay over the next 20 years. When uh, looking at that approach on, on, on uh, focusing in, 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 in uh, 
R&D and actually bringing the technology a little bit further. What is your, why the heck are countries not doing it? Why are we not giving those extra money to research and development? Why are we not doing it? Is it just, what, are the politicians that no. stupid or are we people that, are? what's happening? Well, politicians are really stupid. I think, you know, politicians are both, my, my, my understanding of most politicians are, they're both really, you know, they're well-meaning people. But they have a very different set of success criteria, most importantly of which is they need to get re-elected. And so most politicians will want to tell you, I'm going to save the planet. Now, that actually turns out to cost a lot of money. So what they're going to say is, I solemnly swear I'm going to save the planet in 2050. Which, of course, means they get to take all the applause, but somebody else will have to pay down the line, right? That's essentially what most politicians do. So they postpone this issue, and then what they're talking about is, instead is something that makes short-term benefits. Now, if you put up a solar panel or a wind turbine, you can show, you can get a press conference where you can show, see, I care about the planet. Whereas if you spend the money on research and development, you won't see anything, perhaps except for a paper in science. You know, who knows? What's the point of that? So it's simply a way of generating a lot more attention. And of course, it's a simple argument. We've all heard this. Well, it creates green jobs. Well, let's just analyze that. And we have actually done that in the Copenhagen Consensus. It doesn't create extra money. And not very surprisingly, if you make energy more expensive, you don't actually create more wealth in the long run. Of course not. You're essentially forcing everyone to pay up for that extra subsidy that you're giving away. So you're basically all making yourselves poor. Not dramatically poor, we still get richer, but not just, just not as rich. But also you don't create green jobs. Sure, you create some jobs building the wind turbines or the solar panels, but you have to subsidize those. That means you have to tax elsewhere, which means that those companies will become less competitive and probably shed workers. And the economic models show that on average, that outcome is zero. And of course, what's we've, what we've also seen both in Spain, you know, we've seen the dramatic collapse of, of solar produ uh, producers in Spain, but we've also seen that in Denmark. Vestas, the world's biggest uh, wind turbine factory, has essentially exported all of their jobs to China, either willingly or unwillingly. So fundamentally, we don't get more uh, 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 jobs. We don't get more productivity. We actually get less productivity and probably get about the same number of jobs. It's not that way to go, but it's a simple way for politicians to do because it means they can look good and they can also get rich people backing them. Obviously, Vestas, have, you know, in Denmark, we don't have, we're not that corrupt that you actually give money directly to politicians, but you certainly help them getting reelected. In the U.S., obviously, that's happened very, very clearly. There's been huge funds, uh, transfer funds, for the companies that are, getting, uh, that are getting money, perhaps most famously by the ethanol industry in the U.S., which is another amazing boondoggle. So fundamentally, it's not about the politicians don't know or they're not smart enough and they actually want to do this. It's about us. As long as we keep applauding politicians for saying, I want to save the planet, I'm going to cut carbon emissions, and we all sit there and clap, of course they're going to keep doing that, especially if they can get away with promising in 2050. But if we start asking them, no, I don't want you to spend more of my dollars badly. I want you to start spending less money, but smartly, on research and development. And I know it's not going to look as good in the press, but it's actually going to work. They will do it. Thank you. I, I ask all of you to be as brief as possible, because we have a lot, lots of questions. The gentleman in the third row. Now. Uh, my name is Jan Pravda. I am a geophysicist by origin, but I am in finance for about 20 years. My company trades emissions, so you could say that I'm the bad guy. Uh, but over those years, I've been realizing how impractical these things get. And I'm slowly you know, appreciating what you say, and I totally agree with it. It all seems to make great sense. And I keep wondering, especially the last three, four years, why actually European Union is the leader or the sole leader, in fact, uh, on this seemingly or obviously now suicidal economic you know, track, which uh, you, know, you pointed out very nicely, 250 billion for saving you know, half a degree uh, Celsius. Uh, 
So I wonder if you have thought of this geopolitical or political philosophical reason why Europe is so strong in this and why is it, why is it so stuck where it is? It's a good question. I don't think I have the final answer to it, but I think it's very clear the EU is struggling with its identity. What, what, what is the, the, the reason for the EU? We've made the internal market and we don't quite know what else to do and we certainly don't agree about anything else. The EU very much want, a little bit like the UN, wants to show why it's useful. And there's a few places where you can be useful if you're not the US. One is in peacekeeping forces, and we've actually been pretty prolific in that. I, I, I'm not qualified to judge how well we've done. I think we've done some good in some places. Uh, and the other one is environment. So environment is obviously transboundary, so we can say we need the EU or we need the UN, we need to look at the whole world. So it gives them purpose. I think that's to a very large extent why the EU is talking so much, especially because we're falling behind in economics and we're nothing in terms of military. So you know, we're trying to be soft power, as, as the Americans call it. We, we want to showcase that we can be moral leaders, and, and we like to be that in many ways. I appreciate that. I, I actually think we should try to be moral leaders. I'd just like us to be correct moral leaders. I'd like us to you know, actually be smart uh, moral leaders to come out with arguments that will actually work. So you know, I applaud the, the idea, but I think we're just really bad at doing it. Okay, this is briefer, but could you make it even briefer? I'm Ambi Tjedlička, I'm from Organization Reformist CZ. We are deeply skeptical about climate change, uh, probably more than you. And I would like to say that you should be very alert when Mr. Moldan says that you're right about something. He's the guy who is responsible for this solar boom that we have. We have the most solar panels in the world per capita. And it's going to cost us about one billion crowns. It's not that funny because it's just about one check budget in the next 20 years. So it's a big criminal act, you can say, if you are not politically correct. And but, so I think you should be very much alert when he agrees with you on IPCC. I see that you're giving this very same lecture for some six years. Isn't it time for you to come out and say, you know, this IPCC is a big giant fraud. There are so many scandals connected with it. We should be open about it. These people are not stupid. They're evil because they are trying not to uh, tackle the global warming. They're trying to uh, lower the population. Maybe they want to make us a little bit poorer. That's what they say when they are not that open. Isn't it time for you to come out and, and tell it to people? Because you are such a big authority. Uh, that was a good, good question. I, I, I think in some ways we'd be much helped, and I, I don't know your relations, uh, but I think we'd be much helped if we stop having this incredible divergence of opinions. There seems to be this, this almost uh, uh, impossible either, you know, it's the end of the world or it's not happening at all. They're, they're all saints or they're all evil people. Uh, I don't know if you've met most of, the, uh, most of the people from the IPC. I've met most of the lead authors of the IPC. I have no doubt that these people are, are with strong integrity. They feel very strongly about what they're trying to do. They have been, and I, I, I don't know if, you, uh, if, if the rest of the audience know, you know there have been scandals with the IPC. Uh, they've, uh, they famously predicted all the Himalayan glaciers would be gone in 2030. Turned out that it was not only a, a, a mistake from the paper that they were referring to, but they were probably also referring from gray literature. Uh, there's no doubt of, of the, essentially a, a green NGO paper so there's no doubt that the stuff has crept in and, and you know, with w w uh, about 300 people authoring these. I think some of them also have very strong opinions. I've uh, famously been battling with one of them who is now uh, deceased, uh, uh, Stephen Schneider, who is a, you know, in, in many ways a grandfather for many of these uh, people who have been writing the, uh, 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 the UN Climate Panel report. But I think at the same time you also need to recognize, for instance, when you look at sea level rise, there's been lots of people, Schnell Huber, uh, uh, Ramsdorf in, in Germany arguing that sea levels are going to rise meters you know, over the next century. And the UN Climate Panel has actually been pretty good at saying, no, that's not what our research shows. Yes, we recognize some people are very far out in saying that it's going to be incredibly high. There's also some people out there saying it's going to be virtually nothing. We actually estimate it's going to be somewhere in here. I think they often show restraint, but you're right. They don't always do that. It would be very surprising if a big organization like this in a very politically inflamed uh, uh, situation were totally you know, straight 
but I think they have been as straight as possible, and, and certainly uh, I, I, I find it hard to look at any other global uh, uh, report where we've gotten as f reasonably fair arguments. But I, I totally agree with you. I don't think you should just totally accept everything the UN Climate Panel says, but I think we've really got to recognize they're, they've done pretty well. As to, the, uh, as to the sense of, of I, I have no idea of what the billion crowners uh, uh, and, and whether that's a crime against humanity, I would be surprised if that was the case. I think it's much more a question of saying there's been a lot of bad policies implemented all across Europe and really also all across the developed world. What we need to say is not go after scapegoats and say this is because of that person or because of that bad policy. What I would hope is that we can get people together and say I recognize what you're trying to do but it's not working in the way that you want it to do. Let's now start talking about how can we actually do this. I honestly don't think the, the, the conversation needs more screaming on both sides of the aisle. It needs a lot more people saying, let's be smart about this. Let's find a center position. Let's find a pragmatic solution that'll actually work. So I applaud you, as, as I actually applaud you for, 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 for feeling very strongly about this, but I think we'll be much better served by talking about what will actually work in the future. I hope, I, I'm sure that doesn't answer all your questions, but some of them at least. David, the, over there, this, this guy has been, I'll count on you, I'll try, but really try to be super brief, all of you. Uh, hello, I'm Martin Panek, I'm a student in the University of Economics. I have a very simple question. Have you presented this or have you talked with the guys in the European Commission or the European Parliament? Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've talked to uh, the, some in the European Parliament. No, I haven't talked to, uh, talked to the Commission. Uh, I've, I've talked to a fair number of people in the, uh, uh, in the national governments. Uh, but again, there is a very big gap from what you want to present outwards and what you talk about and what you know inwards. I mean, I, I, most politicians, uh, uh, when you talk one-on-one, uh, -on -one, they know very well that you, you know, we're not going to get anywhere with a Kyoto-style uh, approach but still they'll go out and talk about, uh, about that when they come out in public. So I, I still think it's up to us to make sure that people stop you know, demanding unrealistic uh, uh, solutions and start asking for cheap and effective solutions. Okay, the, the guy behind you? The, the mic? Oh. Uh, David, David. You want to ask My name is Jan Kaleta. I am uh, the student of Cevro Institute, and uh, my question is about Gulf Stream. Uh, what happens if it stops? Uh, what is it the likelihood, and isn't the cutting down the carbon emissions the only solution? Yes. Thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Actually, when you, look, uh, uh, when you look at the Gulf Stream specifically, is the Gulf Stream going to shut down, and that actually going to uh, you know, dramatically uh, 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 cool uh, especially Western Europe. That's been sort of a, a recurrent worry in, in, uh, in much of the climate conversation. The UN Climate Panel actually came out and said in, in its last report in 2007, it's just not going to happen. It says so very clearly, actually surprisingly clearly, uh, given, uh, uh, given what we just heard before. Uh, and, and I think it's also just simply a fact of we ran the models. It turns out you can really only get it to shut off in a two-box model, which is a very, very simplified version of, of the Atlantic Ocean. And in any realistic simulation, you can't make it shut down. But, uh, but, and, and let me just also give you a sense of what we are likely to see. Uh, the models estimate that we're going to see a slowdown of the Gulf Stream. But that will actually only mean a cooling, relative cooling over Western Europe. But of course, because temperature is actually going to rise because of global warming, we will see an amelioration, less rise of temperature, which is exactly what climate change policy would want. So actually, that's not a bad thing. But let me recast your question in a, in a bigger frame. The idea that we're worried about something bad happening, you know, something really out of whack, what they call a tipping point. You know, something that we didn't actually expect or is hard to predict and suddenly goes wrong. The Greenland melts, you know, in, in, in 50 years and we're all going to be inundated. That kind of stuff. The really scary stuff. That's very often argued, then we need to cut our carbon emissions. But the reality, of course, is any realistic carbon cut is never going to be able to effect a change that will actually have the wanted implication. If you have a tipping point or close to a tipping point, anything you do with cutting carbon is going to be very unlikely to have the necessary impact. That's where you need uh, uh, geoengineering. If you want to do something 
that works fast and that dramatically lowers temperatures in, in the terms of decades, you really need to look at geoengineering, essentially making the planet slightly cooler. The planet has done that all the time. Essentially, when you have big volcanoes, they spew uh, particulates, mainly sulfur, into the stratosphere. You get a slight haze around the planet, you know, not enough that you can actually see it, uh, but it'll perhaps reflect half or 1% of all sunlight, and that will actually cool the planet. We've done that lots of times, Krakatoa in 1829, tw sorry, 18 something, 18, early 1800s, uh, 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 Mount Pinatubo in 1992 uh, uh, did it, lowered uh, temperatures for about half a degree for two, for two years. So we know this can be done. The question is, should we be doing it? I'm not advocating that we should. I think we should be spending money on looking into whether it works. But the only real way to deal with uh, tipping points in the next 50 to 100 years is through geoengineering. Obviously, we also need to fix global warming in that long run, but we're not going to be out of the woods on, on, on tipping points, at least for another 50 to 100 years. Thank you. The gentleman next to the one that had just asked a question. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Radim Špaček, and uh, I was a biologist, and now I am a freelance consultant in, uh, in environment. And I'd like to make a remark from the biological point of view. Uh, the climate has been changing throughout the whole history of the planet. And actually, those eras when uh, the life blossomed best were much warmer than, than, we, uh, than we experience today. And uh, what, uh, what, what, what's also true and what should not be forgotten is that the optimal concentration of, of CO2 for plants is between 2 and 3 percent. And now we are about 400 parts per million, which is about 100 lower then is the optimal concentration for, for plants. So the plants would be much happier if the concentration rises. But I, I'd like to ask uh, two, two points. You mentioned uh, the uh, hurricanes. And uh, as, as far as I remember, I noticed that uh, especially after the Al Gore's uh, movie, uh, several or maybe all of the hurricanologists complained against uh, the clue between global warming and hurricanes because they insisted that uh, there is no uh, correlation. So I, uh, I wonder what's, what's your opinion or, or what, what our new uh, knowledge is about, about this. And uh, the other question is maybe a bit personal. You mentioned that you believe that Al Gore and all these people mean it frankly and they really want to do good. But uh, how does it uh, how, is it, how is it possible if they hide half or maybe more than half of the truth, be it Al Gore or be it, uh, be it Mr. Mann with his, with his uh, famous ice hockey curve, which proved almost to be a hoax. So do you really believe that they mean it frankly? Yeah. Um, those are good questions. And, and, and one other thing that we fail to remember is that uh, we're actually estimating that the total amount of greenery on the planet is almost going to double because of global warming by the end of the century. Uh, because plants like higher uh, temperatures, they will get more precipitation in general, and they like higher CO2 concentrations. So you're right, but the point of course is to remember, we are not necessarily what matters most for the planet, but we are what matters most to us. So we would like it to be somewhat like it used to be in the past, simply because we built all our infrastructure. You know, to, uh, so, so people in, in, uh, in Rome live pretty well at, at high temperatures, and people in Helsinki live pretty well at low temperatures. But it sucks for both of these if temperatures rise dramatically or if they lower dramatically, even if they get a lot more uh, greenery. And likewise, of course, it's not necessarily the greenery we like the most. Yeah. So, so the, the question here is much more what kinds of futures do we like, and we might not like it quite as much, although the plants might like it uh, uh, immensely. Now, to your two questions, the hurricanes, it's been a very, very contested issue. Uh, I think the, the, the main outcome is almost everyone agrees you cannot see the impact on global warming in the hurricane uh, record so far, and you probably won't be able to see it before the end of the century. Hurricanes are very hard to model. So you actually get 
all four outcomes. So you get more hurricanes, fewer hurricanes, stronger hurricanes, and fewer hurricanes, uh, sorry, stronger hurricanes and weaker hurricanes in the simulations. But most people seem to agree, and I think that's also what's going to be the next UN climate panel, that you'll get slightly fewer and slightly stronger hurricanes. So there will be an impact by global warming, but it's going to be fairly small. Uh, about the, uh, the, the impact of, uh, the, you know, do, do Al Gore believe in this? I, listen, you know people who feel very strongly about a point. They will tend to emphasize the stuff that agrees with their argument and tend to not so emphasize so much the things that don't. You know, that's human nature. And, and so in that sense, the, the point of being a good person is simply saying, I don't think it helps demonizing people. You know, my, my understanding is, and, and certainly when I met people, most of these people do want to do well. They want to make the world a better place. And instead of telling them, you're a bad person, I would much rather talk to them and say, I agree with your goal. We want to make this planet a better place. How do we do that? I actually think there are smarter ways to do that. Why don't we talk about those? That's a much better way, I think, of getting people towards your viewpoint rather than saying, you're, you know, and, and a lot of you know, curse words afterwards. Okay, I'm sorry, we have time for one last question, which is likely to go to you. Uh, good, good afternoon, Martin Potuček, Charles University Center for Social and Economic uh, Strategies. Thank you very much for an excellent uh, performance in terms of cost-benefit analysis applied to a very uncertain field so that uh, in many ways I was surprised how precise were your calculations taking into account big uncertainties we have about future development of the, of the globe. Uh, well, uh, I would like to raise three points. Uh, first, uh, this was the first one, uh, your accuracy dealing with very fussy issues. Second, uh, I appreciate very much uh, your priorities for research. I would be also very happy as a researcher to get uh, more money for research, but uh, I'm not sure whether always this money uh, may uh, bring uh, uh, outcomes that you suppose they will bring. And my last, uh, my last uh, question is, well, okay, you ended up your analysis by 2100, when we will have the climate uh, warmer by approximately three uh, uh, degrees of Celsius. But what uh, about the world uh, in 2200? There is a big path dependency of uh, development, so will you be happy with the world uh, that will be warmer by approximately six degrees of uh, Celsius in 2200? Thank you, and, and very precise questions. That's why I just had to write them down. Uh, so so uh, the precision, absolutely. Uh, I, I hope I also indicated when I made the first point of saying, uh, you know, it's 0.7% it's of, uh, of, of, of global GDP. No. It's in that order of magnitude, and that's important to remember. Uh, so, so when I make these numbers and when I make these very precise estimates up here, sure, there should be wide error bars on them. But because most of my points are orders of magnitude away from the argument, so when we talk about, you know, you get two cents back in your dollar, sure, that could be four cents. That could be even ten cents. It wouldn't matter for the analysis. And that's why I feel fairly comfortable about it. I actually think making the extra academic point would actually make the argument much less clear without bringing in any extra uh, 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 benefit into the conversation. It really only ma matters when you're very close, you know, when, when if, you, if you said it was 50 cents per dollar, maybe it'd be relevant to start saying, well, it could actually be a little above one dollar. The second part is, uh, on, on, on that question is to recognize that most of the things that we're talking about are marginal changes. So we're talking about should you change a little bit from otherwise emitting lots of CO2 to slightly less CO2. And here, fortunately, the benefits are much, much more certain because no matter whether you have a catastrophic model or you have a very mild model, what you're essentially doing is you're changing slightly in the margin. 
So in the catastrophic model, you still get the catastrophe. So your marginal benefit is still low, whereas if you change in the model, so your benefits on the margin actually turned out to be a lot less uh, variable than the total numbers. So in a sense, we, we cancel out because we look at, uh, at, uh, uh, at marginal uh, efforts, we cancel out a lot of the uncertainty. The second part of your question, I, sorry, I just got to go back because um, the R&D, Sure, not all R&D is well spent. I think there's a crucial conversation needed on how do you actually spend that money in order to do the most good. Uh, one of the points I've tried to make is we should take a page out of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation playbook. Uh, they they uh, set up a blue ribbon panel to make uh, essentially look at what are, the, what are the things they want to see solved and then they only give money within those areas. I'd like us to set up priorities and you know, what are the hundred things that we'd like to see solved in the next 10 or 15 years? And then set up X prices for those so that we would guide a lot of researchers towards those targets. Because if you just set a lot of researchers away with a lot of money, you're gonna get a lot of funny results. You know, some of it is gonna be interesting, but some of it is gonna perhaps be very useless from a societal point of view. So I think there's some need for guidance. But there's also a need for recognition that research and development money is very often wasted. And that's okay, because we just need one success for every you know, 10 or maybe even 100 failures. Your last question was, uh, what about 2200? You're absolutely right. I only looked till 2100. That's mostly because that's become the convention in, in, uh, in uh, climate research. And it also means that there's a lot more numbers available and a lot more studies that indicate uh, the, the, the numbers and, and, and predictions that I present up here. But I think, in some ways, there's two parts to the concern about looking out to 21, uh, 2200. One is that if you follow the solutions that I also come up with, we will have avoided a lot of the problems in 2200 because it's very unlikely that we will not essentially find CO2 uh, replacements before 2100. And I would, I would say way before 20, uh, 2100. In that case, it's not all that relevant to look out to 2200. But the second part is, I actually think there's something bizarre about looking too far out into the future. Uh, imagine us sitting in 1800 and talking about what should we do for today. I think it'd be very unlikely that we were talked about, you know, how we should have put up fiber optic cables to help us or, you know, any other kinds of things that would actually have helped us in, in, uh, in 2012, except for the very generalized points of making more information available. You know, knowledge is one of the few things that we actually know keep helping us, and you can basically use in whatever way you want. Uh, so except for very generalized ideas, maybe more education in 1800, we would have been very hard pressed to help 2012. And that's why I, you know, I, I, I think there, there's some, some sort of, uh, just because we can run the climate models to 2200, I'm not really sure we all that well informed about what to do, uh, you know, just like when people talk about three, the year 3000. I, uh, that just boggles my mind. I'm not sure the Vikings would have had anything sensible to say about what we should do today. So, you know, for those two reasons, I think that's why we, you know, we're, we're well served with talking about 2100 and now. Thank you. I'm sorry, we ran out of time, and uh, we have to respect uh, the time of Bjorn Lomborg. He's, he's got other, other appointments now. Now, what remains to be said that I'd like to thank the organizers for making all this possible, and I thank all of you for coming. Stay tuned to the web of the Severo Institute, and, and come again. Thank you for your presentation, and a big round of applause for Bjorn again. Bye-bye.